Bouncing in and out of my storage unit the last few days, it occurred to me that I haven't really talked about this, the final chapter in the information cube, that storage container that lived in my backyard for years and is now both a distant memory and a present thought. This is Jason Scott Talks His Way Out of It, a podcast about technology, history, and getting myself out of debt. Thanks to Daniel Boyd, William Hearn, and the hundreds of other supporters on Patreon and elsewhere who have been supporting me and helping me get out of debt. At this point, it's not very easy to hear much about me and not hear about the information cube. It was a shipping container that I had put in my brother's backyard when I was living with him to store all of the computer equipment and related ephemera that had come out of the house that I moved out of from Waltham, Massachusetts. It was initially way too much space for what I needed to do. A 40 by 8 by 8 foot shipping container is basically adding another annex to someone's home. You can store cars in it. You can store all sorts of boxes and equipment and computers and monitors, and it just swallows it up. Not only that, but I had the pleasure of walking through it, that ability to take a tour through this box in our backyard. Reality set in after a few years. It became the place that had to deal with me saying yes to everything. If somebody had a pile of magazines, I said yes. If they had floppy disks or monitors or were getting rid of a trunk full of computers that used to be part of their childhood, I said yes. And that pile, that pile of saying yes, grew out of control. When you have a large area that you're storing something in and you're engaging with dozens or maybe hundreds of people, you can definitely convince yourself that you're staying on top of it. When somebody would send me a bunch of boxes, I would go through them, and some amount of those boxes would go immediately to other locations that I had set up, either the Internet Archive or a couple of museums or maybe even some video game and collector groups that I had some alliances with. So it felt like I was keeping track of all of this stuff coming in. It wasn't just a matter of leaving unopened materials in a pile and never regarding them. There were entire weekends, entire weeks that I spent in that container trying to get a hold of it. What quickly became obvious was that there were sets of materials that I was never going to deal with, either magazines that I was loath to cut apart and scan or which I knew online editions existed for, and my scanning them would be redundant, but I didn't want to just throw out the originals. Over time, these became really prominent black plastic bins that would never be opened. They were protecting the items inside, but it wasn't clear exactly what for. The same situation happened with the computers. I had a lot of monitors that I knew were unique and were not going to be coming back into people's lives anytime soon, but I also knew I was never going to use them. As a result, there were shelves upon shelves of televisions and monitors and power supply units representing all sorts of bizarre voltages and connectors, but there was no chance I, personally, was going to turn them on. All of this came to a head when my brother and I decided I should find an apartment of my own. There was no way he was going to allow this thing to stay in his backyard, and in fact he wanted it out before I was going out. So it was a rush to undo seven years of storage in just about a month and a half. I had lots of awesome people fly in and help me go through things, including my friend Kyle, who actually stayed at the house day in and day out and helped me clean. And my great friend Chris Orcutt, who came in with caffeine and energy and helped me get a whole bunch of it gone at the end. So where did it all go? Well... A lot of it went to the Internet Archive, certainly a lot of floppy disks and magazines and parts that I thought had a more permanent worldly need went to the Archive to be stored in their shipping containers for later. 
the computer magazines and entertainment magazines went to the Strong Museum of Play, where they are still under my name, but part of their larger library. The video game cartridges and systems went to either the Museum of Art and Digital Entertainment in Oakland, California, or to the Vintage Computer Federation in New Jersey, depending on which ones wanted it first. And then there was the rest, which is what I really want to talk about here. All the rest, the boxes, the books, the software, the computers, that for whatever reason I thought still represented me and something I wanted right near me, were still sitting in storage units a few miles from my apartment for the last few years. Across these last two months, I've been attacking these two units with a lot of force and a lot of experience. This is where I think lessons can be learned. Why did I keep things? Why, when I was getting rid of a tractor trailer's worth of material, did I still keep things? Well, a bunch of reasons. Either the material was something that was precious to myself, my own personal story, or it was a piece of equipment that I found valuable in a way that I wanted to be 100% sure that if it left my control, my caretaking, that it went into hands as caring as mine. Some of it was film equipment, camera equipment, or materials that I use in professional or personal work that I wanted to maintain somewhere but not in my apartment. And then finally, some of it were what I call nightmare boxes, chowder boxes, boxes where everything in it is so jumbled up, so mixed, so weirdly intertwined that it would take an operation to figure out exactly what's in there. I would say about 15 or 20 of the boxes in my storage units qualified for that. This year, then, was the year of finally figuring out what I truly wanted to keep. These two storage units are now separated across two very distinct lines. One unit contains two types of items. Items very precious and personal to me that are in odd shapes, like my first Commodore pet, my very first home computer, along with paintings and posters and copies of documentaries that I want to make sure stay pristine. The other half of that container has what I call outgoing material. These are floppy disks, books, manuals, magazines that I know I don't want to keep. Items that I want to see scanned or imaged or sent off to people or entities that I know will do something with them. Once I started going through my boxes and moving aside just floppies and just software boxes that I knew fell under this, I was stunned at how much of it represented that. Thousands upon thousands of floppy disks, thousands of CD-ROMs, piles of cartridges, still here, still waiting for me or someone I appoint to do the work. In the other storage unit, things are looking pretty good. At this point, it represents those chowder boxes I'm talking about and items that, for the first time in what feels like 20 years, I would consider to be my personal attic. Items that really mean something to me and trying to explain each individual piece and why it matters. Well, none of it matters if I'm gone. And if I get around to looking at it, well, I'm going to have that memory, but I don't think anybody else is. Maybe a slip of paper from my first bank account, or a very special vinyl figurine that I bought from an online music artist back in 2003. I love having weird little drawings that I did, both in high school and college. When I thought that I might become a cartoonist or an animator, there's saved letters and printouts and pieces of documentation or labels from things that I bought where the item is long gone, but there was something so interesting about the sticker that was applied to it that I carefully cut the sticker out and put it into a memento book. 
There's piles of photos, some of them preserved, some of them not, from various photo shoots I did or from photos that were sent to me. Some of the weird little pieces in their stories are impossible for someone to discern unless I tell them why. For example, there's a small, relatively insignificant pile of toilet-related items. This was because in my sophomore year in college, I made a horror film that was a combination animated and live action piece called Incubus about a toilet that came to life. To shoot it, we threw dry ice into the toilet, which I don't suggest, but I still have the pamphlet and the receipt from the dry ice company because the guy I talked to was really interesting. Later, somebody had found a small doll of a toilet with eyes that looked a little bit like my character design, so that got into the pile, along with the hundreds of drawings I did for the animated part that I used and then kept around because they represented, you know, weeks of work trying to draw this toilet. I don't know if somebody would look at all of those disparate little pieces and know that story, but every time I look at it, I remember how I spent that month and a half and the fun that we had, my roommate Mike Delonzo and I, as we ran around the house throwing plungers at each other and shooting with both 8mm and 16mm film as time permitted. There's now a shelf of old computer equipment, not necessarily stuff that I would use anymore or even which would have a use anymore, but which I keep around because, for the moment, I think people would expect me to have an old Commodore 64, an old Apple II, some monitors, a few modems, a few power supplies, pieces of the Bell telephone system with the old Bell logo on it. Stuff I can whip out for a photography sake, maybe a selfie or including something for someone else or an art project. It looks like old 1980s and 1990s technology. It just seemed like I would want the flexibility to keep that around. Recently, MC Frontalot asked me to do a photo shoot with him, so I grabbed a few of these things, the Commodore 64, the old modems, a few other pieces of equipment, and we met up at the old World's Fair location in Queens. And Frontalot and I did all sorts of poses with this old equipment, and I thought it just came out great. He ended up using them for all sorts of promotional material that year. As I've been drilling down into these chowder boxes, these little tiny black holes of memories, mementos, and trash, it's been interesting to see where I am now compared to what I was when I had these items the first time around. There have been times when I could barely get enough money to eat. There have been times when I lived high off the hog, just spending money like it was going out of style and never coming back. Or items that I got from someone who cared about me and just wanted me to have something to remember them by. Pieces of a life that I long ago stopped living. Sometimes I pull something out and I am completely unable to tell you why it has lived this long in my possession. It has nothing distinct about it. I can't quite remember why I ever got it. I don't even know if I'm the person who put it in the box. And I either throw it out or I keep it around one more round. If something is in these boxes, it may have traveled hundreds of miles from New York to Boston to back again. It may have gone with me around the world as something I kept in my pocket. It may have been something that I stored under my bed in my rent control department when I was 21. It may even be something I had as a teenager that I drew or sketched on or wrote or got from a friend. All I know is that fundamentally it was once a part of me, but it isn't anymore. Obviously, there's no end in sight. There's no situation where I end up with a completely empty storage unit and I close the door and walk away. I'm going to end up having something that represents my core stored items. Either papers that I consider to be part of my official estate and something people can look at, or items that I refer to time and time again and I just want to make sure they're where they are and safe. 
I don't think it's very healthy to think of trying to hit some sort of milestone when it comes to keeping your own items. I've met people who are in all stages of this, going either into deep, dark archives they keep in their basement, all the way to having basically nothing and moving into what they know is going to be one of their final homes, having the minimal amount of material that they've captured up through 70 or 80 years. It all comes down to you and what you consider to be part of yourself. I can warn you, but it won't help the people it needs to help, and it won't help the people who've already been helped by it, to tell you that your items are not you, and that your items are not your parents, your family, your history, your legacy. They have aspects that bring those out, but the part of it that comes is you. It's your story, your feelings. Your personhood is the legacy of your life and the life of those who came before you. If you have kids, well, first of all, don't take any advice on parenting from me. But it might be best to think of your children as taking the parts of what were you and moving on with them to their own story. It's up to them. I remember a couple times I've said that we really have to think in hundred year segments, that the next hundred years people will take what was before, they will find value in some things, and they will throw away the others. And that is their prerogative as the living. Maybe there's efforts made to make things survive longer than that, and it's great, but I don't know if every single generation is inherently indebted to keep the previous generation's priorities, beliefs, and mores alive. We'll see how that all works out. Or I should say, somebody else will, because it won't be my job. So the ghost of the information cube, that shipping container, lives on. It's a small piece of what was once there. The glory and the wonder and that ideal of me having a museum's worth of materials in my backyard, well, that chapter's closed. This is Jason Scott Talks His Way Out of It. Thanks to James Bekoyanu, Mark Pilgrim, Scott Roseanne, Joshua Stein, Scott McGrady, and the hundreds of other supporters on Patreon and elsewhere who have been supporting me and helping me get out of debt.